Hello and welcome back to the F2 show. I'm your host Fraser Ford and joining me to review all of the action from this weekend, we have Inside F2 editor LA Wilshaw and Inside F2 writer Aaron Harper. Coming up on the show then, an incredible duel between our title rivals. We reflect on a thrilling battle between the two of them. Formula 2 action around the Principality didn't disappoint. We reflect on the winners and the losers from this weekend. And we take a look at how this weekend's result impact on the championship standings. Okay, uh, before we start, actually, uh, I'll make sure I've got my mic turned on. uh, Because, uh, is that on? Is that working? Yeah? Good stuff. All right. For the last time out, my mic wasn't plugged in properly. So it's a little bit echoey. So uh, yeah, I'm glad it's working. All right. Aaron, I'll come to you first. First time on the show. Uh, Welcome, obviously. Uh, You're not a stranger to the podcasting world, though, are you? No, I'm not. Uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, I run my own podcast uh, called The Fire Red Lights. It's uh, dedicated to uh, Formula One. So I review the races. I do uh, predictions. I do a few bits on YouTube. Um, so yeah, come and check it out and uh, give it a listen as I try and uh, embark on a journalism career. So the sort of starting point of my career. Good stuff. Love that. And hopefully we can help with that as well where we can. LA, great to have you with us. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Uh, can you give us a, a 30 second weekend review of all of the Formula One action? Is that something you're up for? Look, I'll, I'll give her a Formula Two. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Did you not just say Formula One? <laughs> right. Wow. Well, I meant Formula Two. You know what we mean. You know what I mean. It's it's off the back of watching the Formula One, isn't it? That's what it is. It's, uh, you go Formula Two, Formula One, back to Formula Two again. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I can give you a full minute, and I can give you 30 seconds on F1 as well. But no, <laughs> let's not. Yeah, not so yeah. Are you ready now? <laughs> yeah, thirty seconds on Formula Two. Producer James, can we get a timer in the screw in the corner of the screen, please? Is that all right? And LA, when you are ready, let's go for it. Oh my gosh! All right, thirty seconds. Here we go. Right. Well, I actually felt that uh, for the sprint race, there wasn't that much occurring, um, except for um, Hughes and D- uh, Drogovic providing the "Where's Wally" entertainment. Um, you know, Hughes stalled at the very beginning. He didn't catch up for the entire race, including behind the safety car. And and you, I was watching his times and thinking, well, where is he? Why is he not catching? And, and he never did catch that group, um, which was quite extraordinary. And I don't really know what happened to that. Um, and, and then Djokovic kept just going in and out of the pits, in and out of the pits, changing his tyres. And he just disappeared off the face of the earth a few times. Um, and, and he even disappeared from from the, the timings down the side of, of the screen, of the television screen. Um, and I don't know if he went off for a little excursion. I don't know if he's still you know, driving around that circuit now after the F1 race. I've no idea. But no, he did actually um, reappear at some point. Um, but Hauger, Hauger led and he won from the start, uh, five seconds ahead of Daruvula as well, which was absolutely excellent and extraordinary as well for that particular type of race like Monaco. Brilliant. So it was Hauger, Daruvula and Armstrong on that podium for the sprint race. And then we had the feature race. I know I'm already going over. Doesn't matter. <laughs> feature race. <laughs> well, it was kind of like nothing had happened the day before with Drogovic because he led from the start and he held off an incredible amount of pressure there from, uh, from Teo Pusher. Who was who was on his back pretty much the entire way, trying to force him into an error, and he, he had the drive of his life. I felt, you know, it was absolutely amazing. Like I said, the day before never really happened, um, and by the end, Pusher was was physically exhausted. You could see him leaning, you know, against um, sort of the little tables they had their drinks on before the podium, um, and I've never seen him like that before, you know. And that it took a lot out of him that race. Um, Liam Nasani didn't get off that line, um, unfortunately for Liam. I'm sure we're going to talk. About about him now very sad just seems to have not much luck at Monaco um and then there was pitch met pit, pit lane infringements going on but then they were getting cancelled so I'm not quite sure what was going on there and if there was a an error in the in the you know to do with race control or not and the cars who know, who really knows I'm not sure if that got answered and then we did have um Djokovic and Pusher in in a very long slow pit stop and at one point you're thinking because the camera is on Djokovic thinking oh Pusher's gonna get this he's 
he's going to nip out in front of him. And they both had a really long, lengthy pit stop, which was then another extraordinary moment of the marshals trying to push a car back in backwards into the pit lane. And everyone just had to sort of stop and just wait there <laughs> for the marshals to, to move and clear. Uh, Cordiel hit the barrier. Um, and Iwasa was involved in another incident with Callum Williams, uh, another crash. There was a you know few fewer points and and seconds and uh, penalties handed out. And really, that was the Monaco race weekend for Formula 2. And I've probably done two minutes, maybe more. Hello, Wilshaw. That is a 30-second going on three minutes review of the Formula 2 weekend. Good job. Lovely stuff. Okay, we are going to talk about all of that coming up. Uh, But before we do that, let's take a look at the championship standings after round five. Felipe Drogovic extends his lead at the top to a massive 32 points over Terry Porsche. Marcus Armstrong moves into fourth in the standings after a double point scoring weekend. He sits just three points behind Jehan Daruvula now. Yuri Vips moves into the top five and Jack Doohan moves into the top six for the first time this season. And the team standings... Like their driver, MP extends their lead at the top of the team standings to 29 points over ART. High Tech move into third in the standings ahead of Prima and Carlin. And two strong weekends in a row see Virtuosi move into the top six. And the full standings are available on our website www.insidef2.com. Okay, a week on then, and here we are again talking about Felipe Dragovic, winner of the feature race for the second weekend in a row. Three wins in eight days, LA. What an unbelievable couple of weeks for him uh, and, and an unbelievable performance this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, he did the double in Barcelona, you know, the two wins there. Um, And, um, you know, he's also won a feature race uh, in in Jeddah and he's won the feature race today. Um, He's had points in every single race except for the sprint races today. Um, and, and, you know, 113 points, you know, so far, as you've just seen, Um, you know, I... I think it's been a while since we've seen a driver dominate uh, this much in Formula 2. There's been quite a lot of shuffling and quite a lot of um, changes with with who's at the top. And, you know, it could potentially be the top 10 drivers at any point. I'm not so sure he's necessarily running away with that championship yet because, you know, we have seen the issues of yesterday. Maybe that will will reoccur. But also, as I just said, we haven't seen this sort of dominance for, for quite a while off one particular driver. And maybe this is his season and we're just going we are going to watch him run away with it yeah definitely haven't seen this much dominance this early on in the season that's for sure I I mean I don't know about you Aaron but I I thoroughly enjoyed watching the two best drivers in the championship so far this season really scrap it out Porsche putting the pressure on Drogovic sustaining the pressure Uh, not quite the Formula 2 action we're used to in terms of the the carnage and and the overtakes but it was a different kind of entertainment wasn't it did you did you enjoy it Aaron yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a really interesting battle, especially in the feature race, because there was a bigger picture to it. It wasn't just they're competing for the race win. There was the championship picture at play as well. And considering this is the longest F2 season in history, they had to balance up the, the risk and reward, which, if you think about it, is really good preparation for a potential move into Formula One. Because in in many circuits at that level, Overtaking is very tricky, and we know just how difficult it is to overtake, uh, even in Formula 2, around Monaco. So Pocher in second had to really weigh up the the need to close the gap on, on Drogovic, but also to not throw it in the barrier and, and score no points because the, the pair of them going out would have only benefited Drogovic. And it would have let, say, uh, maybe a, a, a Johan de Ruvela come into the championship fight so there was that mental element at play as well as the the tactical and skillful element of navigating a car around the streets of Monaco. So it was really interesting to see how each driver applied pressure and resisted pressure and just generally went about their business, which was really, really fascinating. It was. It was brilliant to see, wasn't it? And, and you're right, you know, real, real good scrap between the top two. And a word on Teo Porsche LA. H- how will he reflect on this weekend? Will, will he see it as a strong weekend or will he see it as lost points in the championship battle? 
Um, well, I, I kind of think he'll he'll feel a bit both ways in a way because, you know, he, he has put on his social media that he's he's celebrating a second position. You know, he sort of put a little, you know, sort of for the two, a little emoji and a, and a bottle of champagne. Um, but obviously, if you heard the the radio, uh, team radio at, at the end of that race, you know, he, he sounded quite down and he said, I'm sorry, guys, I don't know what to say. Um, you know, I think we once again proved that we are kings of Monaco, the kings. And um, yeah, you know, you can kind of agree with that because I fully paid did sort of hold him up really, didn't he? You know, Teo was on his back the entire way pushing him. And I feel that if Teo would have got past uh, Felipe, he would have been off. He would have been off in the distance. And a bit like Dennis, you know, won by five plus five seconds the day before, Teo could have easily have won by that and maybe even more. So I think from that point of view and from a championship point of view as fans and as watchers, it was perhaps disappointing that we didn't see uh, what, what Teo could do with, the, with that ART car because that would have been quite exciting. But again, you know, it's Monaco for you. Not even an F1. You know, you can't get past. You can't get past. That's that's and that's the story. And uh, yeah, no, but but good on Teo. You know, hope he picks himself up. I'm sure he will. He's not had a, the greatest start to the season, has he? One minute here, one minute gone. You know, again that weekend, but he was on the podium. His radio messages really were, uh, they changed very quickly, didn't he? As you say, very downbeat. And then the, the next minute he's saying, yeah, we're the, we're the kings of Monaco. So uh, he obviously picked himself up quite quickly, didn't he? Uh, Aaron, talk us through the psychology of a Formula 2 driver, you know, fighting for a championship. You're in Teo Porcher's position. Do you stick? Do you twist? Do you go for the moves? Do you take the points? What, what, what would he have been thinking, you know, in those last five laps? Well, I think he would have been... Fight, he'd have been fighting that mental battle all the way through whilst trying to drive Monaco, which you don't need any distractions. Sometimes, especially at Monaco, you have to be 100% on the move. And if, if it if it wasn't really available, if you can't force the mistake, then you simply have to bank the points because the risk of ending up in the barrier and scoring nothing at all is even greater than pretty much anywhere else. Because, you know, you take a, a, a standard racing track you can muscle your way by, but you might pick up a puncture because the driver might might not see you. They might just turn in. It might end up in a in a collision. But the the risk of that is much lower. At Monaco, there is already very little room for error. So today he would have been obviously trying to pressure for that mistake, but knowing in his head that yesterday we were the fastest car and driver combination because he was just all over the back of the MP car. So. The fact that he described them as described he and the ART uh, team as still the kings of Monaco kind of speaks about where he thinks that that performance was, I think, because he would have come off the back of of that thinking, ah, oh, man, second place. But it could have been a victory. But I drove so well. And the only thing the only reason I didn't get the win was because it was Monaco. So you, you like you say, his his mood was a bit up and down, but obviously he's he's straight off the back of the performance. So he's got to sort of digest that there and then. And I think it tells you exactly where he's at. He's he's mentally processing things in the right way. There wasn't a, a dive that was a lockup or a near miss. And then after the race, he said, yeah, we, we were the best team. We, we, we should have won that, but we didn't win it because it's just so difficult to pass in Monaco. Yeah, any other track other than Monaco, and he probably sends it, you know, sends it down the inside, and, and as you say, LA goes five seconds up the road. So I think he'll he'll look back and he'll, he'll he'll you know reflect on on a strong weekend, won't he? Let's let's hope so. Realistically, now LA is, I know it's so early in the season, and it's you know we can't quite say for sure, but is it realistically between Drogovic and Porsche for the championship? Can anyone else? other than those two, you know, really take the fight to, you know, Dragovic. Uh, Jehan Derubla, third place, 60 points behind Dragovic. That is a lot, a lot of points to claw back. And is it, is it realistically, is it just between those two now? 
Uh, no, I don't think it's necessarily between those two because it's Formula Two. And because we have a lot more weekends this season anyway, you know, we, we still have, I mean, that was only round five and we still have another 11 to go. Um, and we all know that there are so many points available to Formula Two over the race weekend for the qualifying, for the sprint race, you know, which is which is additional to what, you know, F1 get the luxury of. So not at all, you know, the, the issue that MP had in the sprint races today not quite sure what they were and what was going on there but maybe that car isn't as magical as we're all kind of thinking it is um but then again could have just been a blip maybe it is <laughs> so, you know, as I say he's finished in the points every race so far apart from yesterday so maybe it was just a minor blip but I I we all know we, we had this conversation last season as well the amount of po- look how Robert Schwartzman came back you know uh, and, and other people even 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 Yuki the year before, you know, just clawing and clawing and, and Mick Schumacher the year before to go and win it. We all know that this uh, championship can turn on its head very, very quickly. And I think that's one of the reasons why we all love it so much. You already have to look at Formula One, don't you? Verstappen's uh, a long way behind Leclerc uh, after Australia uh, and now he's leading the championship. So, uh, yeah, let's wait and see as the season goes on. Uh, by the way, did anyone think that Felipe Drogovic, when he got out of the car, I mean, maybe it was me and I was uh, taking notes, to be fair, whilst I was I was watching, but when he got out of the car, I actually thought because of the bright orange uh, you know, outfit he was in, I thought it was a Marshall standing on top of the car and I thought, what is going on here? Did you, you guys think that or was I just being blind? No, no, it's just me. Just oh, me. I didn't know. Oh, no, 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 just you. <laughs> I was to be yeah, looking at his helmet. Praise, he has got tribute. cones on his mind. Praise has yeah. a very relationship with cones just love cones <laughs> exactly that exactly that there you go speaking of marshals uh instant at the end of the pit lane um and i'm not going to go in on the marshals too much because they do such a brilliant job everywhere but monaco in particular um but there was a car that was wheeled across the pit lane aaron in front of our race leader um and it did mean that he was stationary, despite the light being green for, for five seconds. If that had, first of all, it's a safety thing, and we don't want anyone getting hurt. So that that definitely wasn't ideal. But also, it, I mean, if if Dragovic had lost the race lead or the race victory because of a marshal or, if, you know, some marshals wheeling a car across the pit lane, I mean, it would have been uproar, wouldn't it? It would have been up there for controversial uh, incidents within a a motor race and uh, lord knows we don't need any more of those for for now um but i think that, like correct me if i'm wrong i think the marshals only get the say so from race control as to when to go and collect the car because sometimes you see a car sitting there for ages and ages and ages whether um like with formula one the electrical element is still live and they have to get the relevant equipment uh or if they're just waiting for the cars to bunch up and there to be an ample amount of space to recover the vehicle. The the it was Cordial, wasn't it? He was in an interesting position at the end of the pit lane, uh, just by the um, sort of pole position, actually. So to send marshals across there, like normally, would be fine because there wouldn't be a stampede for the pit lane. But the fact that most of the drivers had yet to make their mandatory pit stop. To give the marshals the green light or for the marshals to do that without permission is incredibly dangerous and highly questionable, if you have to say, if that's come from race control. So we can't just lay the blame at the marshals because unless they are doing it themselves, because in Monaco they are so efficient, they are very, very good at what they do because they have to be, because otherwise the race would take a week. Um we have to question whether race control gave the say so for them to do that. If they if they had, it's certainly not their finest hour because they haven't then closed the pit lane um, or allowed the cars to all form up behind the safety car, which would have been maybe the more sensible thing to do. Allow everyone to do their pit stops. Everyone's under safety car. They can all see that the obstacles there, yellow flags. When everyone's around the other side of the track, quickly move the car out of the way, safety car in, and let's go racing again. Because... What you could have had is if, let's say, Drogovic is changing a switch on the steering wheel, he doesn't see it until too late, stamps on the brakes, doesn't stop, and we're looking at something very, very difficult to watch. So you don't really want to think of it like that, but that's the sort of thing you're dealing with. And you, the, the race control, the FIA, 
have to be very, very careful with that. There, There is just no room for error on it. If, so if they've given the green light for the marshals to do that, they need to think very, very long and hard about how they structure the recovery of vehicles moving forward. Yeah, a hundred percent, and and thank goodness everyone was okay. Because yeah, you're right. You you dread to think what that could have been. Okay, moving on then. Our sprint race winner, Dennis Hauger. Uh, this is what we expected to see from him in Formula Two and at LA. That was a much better weekend from him. First win in Formula Two. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, we we saw how well he did in Formula Three last season, and I, for one, was incredibly excited to you know see him come up into Formula Two and to and to you know continue with the the Premier team there. So, um, I I kind of feel like it's a mental turning point for him personally. Um, you know, there was a lot of pressure on his shoulders coming into Formula Two with being that champion. Um, and you know, to, to, to and to be the Premier driver too, um, as well as you know, the year before the rookie Piastri, you know, winning, coming from being champion to winning as well, and it, it's almost like that was turning into the story that if you're F3 champion, you actually have an incredible shot of being the F2 rookie champion, you know, the year after, and. He's a very sensible young man, um, and you know we uh, we we were fortunate that uh, he, he he I interviewed him before the start of the season, and um, he was really he had all these hopes for the season, didn't he? And um, it, for some reason, they they weren't happening for bad luck, something wrong with the car, and it, you know we even know what happened behind the safety car, and you know he went into the pit lane and got all that mixed up and. You know, I'm sure that's still lying with him a little bit, maybe. Um, and he's he redeemed himself. He's redeemed himself, hasn't he? <laughs> because it's like he seems to have been able to put that behind him, um, have a little word with himself and, and just go forward and dominate, you know, even over Jayhan, who is an incredible driver and he's in an equally as, as good a car. So, yeah, it's, it is what we expected. Um, and it's it's he's very exciting young driver, and we're very lucky to have him in Formula Two. So I I would love to pat him on the back for his race win yesterday. You know, well done, Dennis. Yeah, absolutely. As you say, uh, first win of the season for Prema, and that has come from Hauga. Uh, Daruvala, ah, we, he'll be gutted, won't he? That that's not him who's got the first win of the season for Prema. Obviously, points in, in both races this weekend, which, and we said last week on the show that, you know, he's probably the one, other than Dragovic, that's consistently scoring points. But he's kind of struggling. Well, is he struggling to, to take it to that next level and to, to get regular podium, podiums and, and, and that victory, Aaron? He... I, not with with the ruler, I think he's a very quick driver, but he he does seem to be missing that that final step. It's a little bit like uh, a little bit like Checo Perez in F one, where you could just see that the 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 consistency and the talent is there, but has he got what it takes to get to the next step? So that's going to be his sort of short term aim, is to get. A victory again under his belt, um, and we've seen that Prima can deliver a winning car. Um, it kind of baffles me that it, it's taken them until round five to pick up a single victory. Um, but with the Ruvula, there, there's definitely the potential there to to bring home more wins, and he's got that experience. He's in his third season now, I believe, in Formula Two. So really, he should be leading the way in that team, and obviously, he is ahead in the standings, but he'll be disappointed that he's ended up behind Hauger this weekend, especially in the sprint race. So there's there's definitely room for uh, reason to be optimistic for Jahan moving forward. And obviously he's got the backing of the Red Bull um, junior team program. So, you know, you never know, there may be a Formula One seat on offer at some point very soon. Yeah, first one, two of the season, and it does go to Prima. And hopefully, as you say, Aaron, that's a, a real turning point for, for Prima. And Jehan Daruvula can, you know, really start putting in some good performances, some wins, and, and put the pressure on the, the, to, the top two in the standings. We'd like nothing more than that for Jehan. So, best of luck to him. Uh, 
LA, you said in your first second going on three minute uh, weekend review uh, about Liam Lawson. Uh, we're going to go off script a little bit here because we haven't actually uh, scheduled this in. But you said we're going to talk about Liam Lawson. So over to you, Liam Lawson. Uh, again, really, really difficult weekend. He just has no luck in Monaco, does he? Um, no, it doesn't seem like it. Um, I, I kind of feel like I don't want to. I don't. I don't like talking about last year because. You know he did he did everything right and it was this technical infringement that that stole away one of the most prestigious victories that a driver can imagine no matter what series that you're in you know I mean they've they've spoke about Charles this weekend in Formula One you know not not only not doing well in Formula One but not winning Monaco in, in the other series he's been in and yet what an incredible champion he's been in the other series um so for for Liam to have t- had that taken away when he won <laughs> it, it's heartbreaking and um you know and I d- I personally just don't want to keep thinking about last year and going on about it um and then yeah I mean at the end of the day you know if if he if he increases lap time under yellow flags then then that's then that's just not allowed you know, and, and I, it's not that I don't feel sorry for him. Of course, you know, you do, but that's just the rules and that's the facts. And there, there are other drivers as well that had their times taken away. Um, but from a, a personal point of view, because, um, you know, I, I feel like he's a friend of Inside F2, you know, and a, and a friend of ours and a friend of mine, is that I'm personally very, very disappointed and, and very gutted for him um, because, you know, it was lovely to speak to him in that press conference when we all thought he had pole position. Um, and then for him to have started where he ended up starting and then to to not have even got off the line. Um, I'm sure that that he I don't know. I mean, there are many drivers that don't really believe in luck, you know, good luck, bad luck. But, you know, you kind of use it as a phrase and a term, can't you? Um, so I don't necessarily feel he might feel this is an, an unlucky track. It's just a bad weekend you know, uh, for him. And I'm sure he'll just want to put it to bed and put it behind him and move on. But he does have the kind of experience. He does have the kind of maturity to be able to do that. Um, and next race, we'll see him come back and, you know, and, and take Baku by storm and hopefully get himself onto that podium. Yeah, absolutely. Qualifying around Monaco, we spoke about the importance of qualifying on the preview show, didn't we? And yeah, it, it really is a weekend changer. If he's on pole position, likely it is, is that he goes on, he, he wins the feature race, he's third place in the standings, and we're saying, wow, Liam Lawson, is he back in contention for the championship? But the the way it's it, it's turned out, it's it's, yeah, it's been a really gutting weekend for him, hasn't it? So as you say, fingers crossed he can bounce back in Baku. Uh, another driver I want to speak to you about, LA, uh, and one that we haven't really spoken about so far this season, Chen Bolik Bassi, 12th place in the sprint race, 11th place in the feature race. And yeah, by far his best weekend in Formula 2, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think we've probably perhaps not talked about him that much because, you know, he withdrew from um, the, the race weekend in Jeddah when he had the accident and then he didn't no. um, come to the following race after that. It was Imola, wasn't it, after that? So we, he's not sort of been around for half of the time, has he? Um, but, you know, he came back strong. I mean, I don't know if you were watching his uh, t- where he was moving sort of up and down the 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 timings during Barcelona. Uh, I can't remember which race it was, whether it was sprint or feature race now off off the top of my head, but he was doing incredibly well in that race. He was really getting those laps in, um, getting up to to around P12, I think it was. Um, But then he did drop. I don't know what happened again. We tend not to necessarily catch what happens to the drivers that are midfield and beyond that. The television doesn't seem to catch that and we we don't really find out what happens. So something happened and he didn't finish where I was hoping he'd finish. Um, But um, this particular race weekend, wow. (laughs) You know, you're right, you know, P12, P11, just that much off that point uh, today in the feature race. What a shame! Um, I think he would have uh, got you know gone out of his mind with with joy if he'd have got a point today. Absolutely, with the start of the season that he's had. Um, but you know you can't underestimate this young man. He might not have the wealth of experience. 
that that some of these most of these other drivers have um, because, you know, he didn't work his way up through the formulas the way everybody else did. Um, but he is an absolute contender. He is an he is an incredible racing driver. He has a racing mentality. He's a very mature young man. He's involved in everything that, that goes on in the background. He doesn't leave it to everybody. He's involved in the lot. He knows what's going on. He knows where he wants his career to go. Um, and um, yeah, you know, maybe F2 surprised him a bit. Maybe the speed surprised him a bit. I don't know. That's just me guessing, you know. There's also something that um, I think it was Clement said um, about knowing the drivers that he's driving with at the moment because they did come up through the ranks together even from karting you know from from 12 13 14 they were all together so they know each other's driving style they know what what each other's moves are and maybe even breaking how, how a driver's going to break how a driver's going to do in the wet whereas Jem doesn't have that advantage of of you know many of the rest of these drivers so for that alone I think he's doing incredibly and this weekend Wow, well done, Jem. Yeah, absolutely. Nine races to go, nine rounds to go even for him to, to get those points, and I'm sure he will at some point this season. Uh, Aaron, one more person I want to talk about, uh, Jake Hughes. Ah, um, oh, Seriously, you know, on the reverse grid pole, um, yeah, obviously an ideal opportunity for him to pick up his first Formula 2 win for VAR to pick up their first Formula Two win and he stalls on the grid. How, how gutting is that? Oh, I was, it was just awful. Um, at the risk of sounding like British bias, I saw him on sprint pole. I think he's been on sprint pole a couple of times this season. I think so. He's been he's driven really well at a couple of other races, and it's just not quite come together for him or for the VAR team. And I thought he's on sprint pole at Monaco. All he needs to do is get it off the line and. Then he didn't. It was just terrible for him. What was really, actually, really good was that nobody hit him because he's at the front of the grid. That's not actually a straight part of track uh, that they're racing on. So someone could be easily blindsided. Um, although I think it was on uh, Jack Doohan's onboard. And what was really handy, actually, and I thought this was, uh, I don't know if this was by design or just it came by accident. The, uh, the red lights on the back of his car started flashing completely haywire. So yeah. you couldn't miss him. You knew he was there. So that that was really, uh, really fortunate for him that those lights came on. Whether they're supposed to do that or not, uh, I don't know. But that, that was uh, very fortunate because we saw a similar accident uh, last year at Jeddah, didn't we? Uh, where Fit, did Fit, was it Fittipaldi who hurt his foot? Yeah, believe? with poor share. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it felt Deruvalo was so close. How Jayhan missed the back of that car, the skill that that Jayhan shown in that maneuver was just yeah. it was mind blowing. Yeah, very very lucky. I I agree with you there. Very lucky. That was uh, proper cat like reactions from Jayhan, and they're the reactions you need to be a uh, professional racing driver. It, but in in like the grand scheme of things, it was absolute heartbreak for him and then like you said in your uh in your three minute review of <laughs> formula two this weekend uh he never ever managed to catch up even though there was a safety car so th th that win will come for for jake and for var um they've just got to keep plugging away there will be a track where all of this misfortune and these tire woes will play in their direction and all of a sudden the win will just land in their lap and that's just how the racing gods work sometimes. Well, I, I kind of feel like for VAR, you know, they, they come in, they've got they've got great success in the other series and they're, they're coming in with half of the mentality of, you know, we, we are successful. We're a successful team. We've got an incredible factory. We've got an incredible staff on our hands um, and, and we can do this. We can be contenders in the first season. And then they do also 50-50 have the very realistic views of, but it's our first season in F2 and this is going to be a learning curve for us. And from my personal point of view, I think they're doing absolutely incredibly, you know, and I think with Jake, they've got a winner on their hands with him. 100% winner. Yeah, it's a couple of times this season we've seen the pole sitter not get away from the line and it's so gutting to see. But yeah, Jake Hughes, they are very professional outfits. They will bounce back, as you say, LA, and they are doing brilliantly well, considering it's their first season. 
Okay, that's all we have time for today, unfortunately. My thanks to LA, to Aaron to jo for joining me on today's show. And thank you to you guys at home for watching as well. If you've enjoyed the show, make sure you hit give it a like, subscribe for more Formula 2 content, all of the normal stuff. Hashtag the F2 show to get involved in the conversation as well. But from me, Fraser Ford, and all of us here at Inside F2, we'll see you next time.